Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Understanding God's Loving Laws Group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the Human Law Comparison presentation, Jesus briefly compares God's laws with human law in some fundamental areas to set the foundation for two further discussions about flaws in our individual and collective attitudes, feelings, and emotions towards God's laws. Recorded on the 20th of November, 2016, in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. Well, we're still going to try to finish by 4.30. We'll see how we go. We've got this human law comparison. We were going to spend an hour on it. And really, the topic does deserve an hour on it, um, but we won't have the chance to do that. Probably the maximum we're going to be able to spend is about 30 minutes on the subject. So let's get started and having a look at the reasons why we're looking at this comparison. Most of us have a lot of personal pain. Isn't that not true? And most of this pain came from my childhood and it came from the fact that I was exposed to parents who had a certain set of laws and I was exposed to a society that often had a different set of laws than my parents do. And as a result, I'm either governed by my parents' set of laws or my, or my society's set of laws. And, and unfortunately for all of us, we come from different countries, so that means that the country has a different set of laws that affected us as well. So... So this results in a, in a lot of pain for us, particularly when the, pain, the laws are out of harmony with God's laws. So here we have the pain. I've developed attitudes towards the law as well. So there's feelings inside of me, belief systems inside of me, attitudes that I have about law. And let's face it, a lot of us have some pretty negative attitudes about human law. We do. It's like, I should be able to get away with it whenever I want. I should be able to you know, do different things about it. I should be able to just, you know, laws apply to other people. You know, it's good if they obey the law because then my life's safe, but I don't have to obey the law, I'm not thinking about the fact that that then makes their life unsafe <laughs> and so forth. So we, we have all of this stuff and it comes from uh, this childhood experience, but we impose it upon God and God's laws. So then we start going, hmm, God's laws are the same as human laws. And therefore, I can treat God's laws the same as human laws. And I can treat God the same as I treat my parents. And we often try to do that. Hence, we finish up having more pain. So I've had attitudes to God's law which cause me a lot of heartache. And I'm not seeing that a lot of my heartache is actually being caused by my attitude to the law. Right? It's not because... Um, you know, some, a, lot, a lot of the personal things that happened in my childhood, it's now the result that the fact the law, I'm working against the law, and the law is actually having its effect upon my soul. Every time I break a law, and remember there's billions of them, well there's how many? An infinite amount potentially of them. Every time I break one of the principles, I'm breaking every law right, in that moment. This is going to cause me a lot of heartache and pain because when I break a law, there, as you'll find in the next order principles, there's compensatory effects that occur when I break laws from God's perspective. And so these attitudes are actually the main trigger or the main cause of our personal pain that builds up over our life and that stays with us after we pass. Right? So I really need to examine my attitude to God's laws if I want to become happy. You see? I really need to have a good look at this. Why is it that my attitude's out of harmony? What's going on for me? I need to see what's actually going on. So what we want to do is, is make some comparisons. Now, if I compare God's laws and human laws, I have a chance to identify my own soul-based injuries, which prevent me from obeying God's laws. So, so what, what we need to do is look at the human laws and go, okay, what does this cause me to do that if I do it with God's laws is going to cause me some trouble? That's really what we're trying to do here. We're trying to examine the trouble that we cause ourselves by not obeying God's laws because we're imposing our 
attitudes that we had from our childhood experience onto God's laws. So obviously they're going to prevent me from being happy. Mm. An interesting thing too is that if I, if I don't bring my perception of law into harmony with God's perception of law, can you see that I'm never going to be at one with God? To be at one with God, I've surely got to have the same attitude to God's laws that God has. So obviously it's going to limit my ability to be at one with God. So what we want to do is introduce some comparisons between God's laws and human laws so that we can identify our hangover. Now this is the first talk of a three-part series, as I've mentioned before. The second part of it is the human law attitudes and emotions, and the third part of it is the human law hangover. And what we'll be doing is addressing some of your questions then. But you're free to ask questions during the presentation, bearing in mind that I'm going to move quite fast through the presentation. I've got about nine different comparisons to make, and so that means we've got three or four minutes to spend on each comparison at the most. Let's look at the first comparison. With God's laws, the lawmaker is the law enforcer and fully enforces obedience to every law. So that's God's laws. But with human laws, the lawmaker is usually not the law enforcer. So usually the lawmaker is either your parent, right, or society in some way, a caregiver, or society's politicians and rulers. They're the lawmakers, right? But the law enforcers are usually police, police and judges, a different set of people altogether. Right? And the law enforcer, the judges and the police, are not able to fully enforce obedience to every law. And parents are not able to either, let's face it. So what happens in our childhood is this. I live with a parent. The parent tries to enforce some of its own laws upon me. Many of the laws the parent's creating is completely against the soul and the way it works, and hence it's very hard to obey them. And so we struggle with obedience. We usually get some punishment as a result of the disobedience. That then means that the parent has imposed a whole heap of unloving demands upon me that then grow up into injuries, which I want to rebel against. Right? And by the time I'm 13, 14, 15, I'm rebelling against my parents. So my parents throw up their hands in the air and say, I give up trying to impose my law upon you. I'm just going to let society do what I couldn't do. <laughs> right? Isn't that what happens, really? And then society comes along and says, right, let's try and impose our law on you. Most of which you don't know, of course. So don't think that... Don't think that just because you haven't learned about God's laws before that that's unfair because humans have made a whole heap of laws far more <laughs> affect you negatively that you know nothing about. So here they go. They, they make these laws you know nothing about. You break them and then they can't catch you anyway. So what does that tell you? You start feeling like, well, I can break them with impunity. Right? You can see the problem. Right, what's the next problem? The lawmaker and enforcer is infinitely and always aware, perfect and infallible. Remember, this is the universe. We live in it. God, God is the infinite being. We live within God. And remember, God measures our energy, measures infinitesimal amounts of energy. So, so God is infinitely and always aware, perfect and infallible. He knows every energy. Every energy has a mathematical formula. I can measure, God can measure, and by the way, when we develop, we can measure those energies as well. Right? But how is it on earth? The human lawmaker and enforcers have hardly any awareness, particularly any awareness about your intentions. And and are able to fail, are imperfect. They're able to make suppositions, assumptions that are wrong, and they're imperfect. They naturally do because of the, their condition of love. They're naturally going to make suppositions that are wrong. What does this cause us to do? Basically, it causes us to believe that, okay, they're going to make suppositions that are wrong anyway, so what's the point of obeying the law? Well, not bother. Right? What's the next one? Laws are created by the lawmaker only to benefit all creation. This is a big one, right? As you're starting to see through the principles, you should be starting to see by now that all the principles are there for your benefit and the benefit of all creation. Right? 
God doesn't have ulterior motives of making your life difficult. He has ulterior motive of making your life happy and joyful. That's his motive. But what's the motive of most human laws? Well, you could say they're mixed. Sometimes it's about creating structure and order and helping you be happy. Other times it's about, you know, the lawmaker just wants to make a law because he's going to get some money out of it. Or, you know, the lawmaker or enforcer or the policeman, you know, just feels like doing it for the moment. So he does it. Uh, it can be all sorts of things that create these mixed and unpredictable benefits. So what do we learn from that? Don't we learn that most laws are not for our benefit? Pete, you'd like to ask? There's also no consistency with human laws where God's laws have total consistency. Exactly. So we don't know which laws have benefit and which laws don't. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and then with our children, then the consistency, they they don't have any don't any, have any. any boundary then. That's right. So this starts at the parental level. So so most by the time most children are adults, they've they're so used to inconsistent laws that they then think society is making them anyway. So my parents made them, society are going to make them and so forth. So it has a large effect on our attitude. Her attitude is pretty negative from these things towards law, you know. Let's look at the next one. God creates laws to maintain survivability, growth and transformation of all matter living creatures within the universe. That's the purpose of God's laws. Pretty good purpose, yeah. Okay, and we compare that with human laws. Primarily created for the purpose of being a deterrent. In other words, to restrict you from doing something that humans believe is wrong, to try and discourage the most disobedient. So what do we find there? We find that there's a whole series of laws created, most of which we don't know, but they're created for the people who are the most disobedient. And the people that are obedient, what do they get? Nothing. There's no benefit <laughs> for, aside from being able to avoid punishment. There's no other benefit. There's no rewards. You pay your taxes for your whole life. Are you rewarded? No. But if you don't pay your taxes for your whole life, you're very rarely punished, particularly if you fudge the figures, you're very rarely punished. Right? Because they don't know that you have. Right? So this creates a feeling inside of us of, well, there's things I can get away with. I should get away with it because it's right to get away with it. You, get, you finish up getting this self-righteous feeling that goes, I've got a right to disobey the law. It's not good. It's not good. All they're trying to do, they don't reward me. Huh. I'll reward myself. <laughs> Isn't that how it goes? <laughs> What's the next one? Laws operate whether creation is aware or not. It's God's. But laws operate only if the police and the law enforcer is aware. <laughs> this is a big one for us because we go, is there any police around? <laughs> no. Nope. Off you go, right? <laughs> so that's how it is. But, and then if there are police around, he's got to be close enough to catch you, <laughs> close enough to observe you, close enough to catch you, and also want to catch you. Because it, sometimes he might go, so I, I've already caught 200 people this week. That's enough for me. I've got my quota. <laughs> I'll leave you alone type of thing. In other words, individual choices that he's making determine whether you get caught or not. Now, the problem with that is that it makes you believe that if, if you're not being observed by a policeman, then you can do anything you want. Doesn't it? You can do anything you want. Now, of course, it creates a lot of other problems too. In the law hangover, we'll go through a lot of the bigger problems that these things create. Okay, this one's a very interesting one that I'd like to spend a little bit of time on, which is the reason why I've gone through the others so quickly. Laws operate on the heart, soul, attitude, character, thoughts and emotions of the human and the action taken. <laughs> What's the comparison? It's pretty obvious. Laws only operate on the action taken and then only if the action taken is observed, processed and enforced by the law enforcers. 
Right. Now let's compare this one a bit more deeply, shall we? What do you think that does to you? Alex, you want to say? Well, it's pretty obvious. Like, um, you think, the think the thoughts that you have and the attitudes or whatever you feel. Doesn't don't, matter. don't worry about that. Doesn't That's matter, all right. is it? It's only the action I take. Yeah. yeah. So I can feel like raping a few women. As long <coughs> as I don't do it, that's fine. You know, I can, I can feel like stealing from somebody. As long as I don't do it, that's fine. I can be angry with somebody, but as long as I don't beat them to a pulp, that's fine. Do you see what, what it does to us? It creates this condition in us where we believe only the action matters. And even then, we don't even believe that. We believe the action only matters when we get caught. <laughs> and what do we do when we get caught? Oh, well, I did it for this reason, I did it for that reason, there's all these reasons. We rave on and rave on about all the things that caused us to do that thing, you know. And, and we don't take any responsibility generally either, do we? Yeah. What else do you notice about this? Thanks, Catherine. Um, the human laws only act on the action that we take. They... They don't, uh, on the thoughts and emotions, they yeah. are not active, but God certainly does. Yeah, so, so let's compare this with, the, like this, Alex stated this too, but let's look at how God does. That we've seen how God measures energy flow, and this is how God is capable of measuring thoughts, attitudes, character, and stuff like that. God's capable of measuring it. Now, humans are, are not that capable of measuring it, are they, those things? Unless they are highly developed individuals, very much in harmony with God, they will not be capable of measuring those things. Isn't that true? Right. So we then get this thing going on inside of ourselves that goes, well, with people I can get away with things. And we, can all, we also start thinking, with people we can get away with what God has already set in motion. Because we think that people will let us off the hook anyway. So what I notice many happening for most people is they're unloving to a person and, and they think that that's okay because the person doesn't even know they're getting treated badly in most cases. So you know when you have an addiction with another person, the other person doesn't really know they're getting treated badly. They think they're getting treated good because they're getting their addiction met. Huh? But God measures the addiction as a character-based, heartfelt feeling inside of you that's out of harmony with love. So that's breaking God's law from God's perspective. Right? So we have this sort of internal justification that goes, well, they wanted it, so I did it. And many men have this with women with sex. Well, she wanted it, so I did it. Not considering, well, hang on a sec. What did God want you to do in that situation? Right? Many women have it with, with men regarding control, fear-based controls. He'll protect me, so I'll do it. He'll look after me financially, so I'll rely on him to do it for me. There's no internal thing that's going, hang on a sec, is that ethical? Is that actually a soul-based attitude that I should develop? So he's going to do it anyway. Why can't I get away with it? So we start even justifying what are called codependent addictions as people feeding our desires. We even think it's a good thing as a result. Yes, yeah, it's a big problem, this one. This is a big problem because it also helps us. To ten we tend to then go, God can't measure my thoughts. God doesn't know what I'm feeling. It's ludicrous concept. How does he do it? This is impossible. Nobody on earth can do it. It's impossible for God to do it, is what we start believing. And so we start believing that it doesn't matter, as Alex said, what our attitude and thoughts are and our emotions are. We start thinking it doesn't matter. As long as we don't do it, but if we do do it, as long as we don't get away with it, as we do get away with it, sorry, everything is fine. As long as we get away with it, it's all good still. These are big problems that we face with regard to God's laws. Can you see it sort of like 
wow, it's like all these attitudes I have, and how is that impacting on my desire to actually live in harmony with the principles? Quite, quite a lot, right? Mm -hmm. mm. Let's look at the next one. Laws operate consistently under all circumstances with no exceptions. Permanence principle there, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> Human laws? Yeah. Differently in each country. And let's face it, like, there's 200, yeah, in each state in each country. <laughs> so it's not like, it doesn't, like, it can be completely different. You, like in the US, 50, 50 states, 50 different laws about the same thing sometimes. So it's just, a, it's just amazing. And are inconsistently applied according to hundreds, and you could possibly even say thousands of variable factors, such as race, gender are the big ones, of course. But then you could even go attitude, feeling, you know, that even applied differently there. So if you have a, what, what the judge thinks is a bad attitude, you get more punished than if you had a good attitude. So then you can fake a good attitude. So you can go, oh, this, oh, I'm really sorry, <laughs> you know, and then get away with it. And let's face it, many of us have done that with our parents, haven't we? You know, oh, I'm going to get punished, have a cry first, then they might not do it, you know. And, and we apply that to the rest of our life as well, the manipulation of the law enforcer. And, and this, uh, this per permanence principle with God is just like, yeah, do all that, but at the end you're still going to get the same <laughs> thing that you're always going to get. Right. And so obviously this is going to cause us a lot of problems, isn't it, with regard to our connection with God's laws. Each law has loving penalties if disobeyed and loving rewards when obeyed. <coughs> Human laws usually only have penalties. And then only if disobedience is observed, processed and enforced. <laughs> And I say the word processed, meaning, you know, you've got to go through all this rigmarole, don't you? It's like you've got to go to court with a lawyer usually. And there's got to be a process that goes. But even before then, the, in, the, in the, the, the police have to actually charge you, even though they know you've done it. They've got to come up with evidence that supports that you've done it. And they've got to go through all that rigmarole. By the time you've got to the end of that process with some things that you might do, there might only be 5% of the people who do it that get punished. And in fact, with uh, child abuse, for example, it's around that figure, less than that figure. 5% of child abusers get punished because of that problem. Right? In this one, every child abuser gets punished. Uh, might not get punished here on earth, but uh, I've seen many of them in the spirit world, and trust me, there's a punishment involved that far exceeds, in fact, any pain that any person on earth could probably inflict upon them even right. just to correct them but there's also loving rewards when obeyed this is another problem and on earth you go, you go like what's the point of doing it there's, I don't, the only point really of doing it on earth is that I get to avoid punishment that's the only point really and even then we all know that Punishment only comes for a very slight proportion of the people who actually do it. So we, on earth we basically feel like you might as well try to get away with it because that's your reward. If you're clever enough, you've got a reward of getting away with it. Right? With God, of course, if you think you're clever enough, then there's a whole heap of more penalties because <laughs> that's an attitude that's obviously out of harmony with God's principles and so there's even more penalties imposed. Right? So, and this loving reward when obeyed, like God rewards tiny little actions with huge rewards. You know, there's an example of that in the Robert James Lee's material where a guy said to Afra, he said, What? What? Well, he we said to, I think it was my hand, but he said, um, what, why, am I, why have I got all this given to me? And, and my hand says to him, Well, you did good things while on earth. And he said, no, I didn't. I, like, I just worked my guts out, you know, in a shop and did all these things. And, and my said to him, well, look, you, you gave the only pair of shoes you had to somebody who didn't have shoes. And you had to go without the shoes for a while until you found the way to get them. That's one of the things that you did that was loving. And he said, but that was hardly anything. He said, but it doesn't matter. God's going to reward that. And God measures the, that as a reward. This is a part of God's goodness. God evaluates what you classify here on earth as small acts of kindness 
God classifies as immense things that he rewards. Given the fact that the climate on the earth is to generally not do those things, he, he rewards it with immense rewards that, that make adjustments for a whole heap of things that you may have done that are also unloving. But these rewards have a huge, they're a huge play, play, play a huge role in the kind of rewards you experience at the soul level because they're acts of love. Everything's measured by the act of love. So the laws also have penalties and rewards that are loving, consistent and predictable. Again, back to the permanence principle, loving, consistent and predictable. Human laws, penalties are, many penalties are unloving. Obedience is rarely rewarded and the results are usually unpredictable. You know, you can go into, you can do one, the same, two guys can do exactly the same thing. And it can be real bad, like abusing a child or something. They can go into court and one guy can get off scot-free, walk away, and, and another guy might get punished, right? But he doesn't get much punishment often, not commensurate to the crime of the destruction of a person's life for, you know, 40, 50 years, which is what's happened when he's abused a child. So, and then a third guy might be in the same position and he's not even, like, he don't, nobody even knows he's done it. Or the people who he's done it to are so embarrassed to talk about it that he never even gets to court. Doesn't even, and so he goes on doing it for the rest of his life. And we have these problems in religions, of course, doing this. People in any positions of authority frequently are doing this. There's an example of the, the fact that when you obey, you're not rewarded, but also the results are unpredictable if you, if you, are, if you disobey. Your re results are also unpredictable if you obey. See, so you might be a what's called a law-abiding citizen all your life, and someone makes an accusation, a false accusation, that has circumstantial evidence, and you might end up in jail. This is one reason why many of you are afraid of authority, because you think you might end up in jail for no reason. Any sense? Yeah. Okay. I like this one too. Each law deals with and addresses both the cause relating to why the human used their will and the effect, the fact that the human did so use their will to be unloving. So it addresses both the cause and effects. In fact, God's law as respects to the human is all about trying to correct the reason why they chose to do what they chose to do. Right? Human laws, of course, are only punitive, generally. It just deals with the disobedience, the action, but it doesn't address the co cause or reward loving action. So it doesn't actually look at why did the person do what he did. So, for example, in the example of the guy in the book who gave his shoes to somebody else, why did he do it? He did it because he just loved that person enough to give away his shoes. Now, he could have done it thinking that down the track he'd get a reward back. Well, God will measure that and then, then he wouldn't get that reward. Does that make sense? God measures things based on the cause as well as the effect. So he measures the effect and the cause. Both need to be measured, in fact. Okay? Sandra, you'd like to ask? I'm just wondering, um, I know it might be a bad question, but... So on earth when we do something right and you're saying there's rewards, I guess I haven't or haven't noticed some, you know, my personal rewards, but in the spirit world it seems like it's immediate. Is no, no, a true? lot of the spirit world rewards are rewards for things you did on earth that were never recognised on earth. You see, the, the problem is on earth that nobody around us has much connection with love. And so what that finishes up meaning for us is that when we t actually take a loving action with a loving motivation, very few people recognise it. So, so for example, when I start speaking a truth to many of you, you don't recognise it as a loving action. What do you see it as? Like a f an attack. I'm in trouble, yeah. yeah. Yeah, an attack, right? You see yeah. it as an attack. So what do you feel like doing in return? Attacking back. Normally. Attacking back, yeah. yeah. Attacking back, you know, trying to criticise back. Now, if you could feel my feelings for you, mm -hmm. could you see that you'd go, hang on a sec, I can feel he loves me. It's like all my sisters that I just removed this morning. Yeah. I, I love them all. I've spent a lot of time with each of them. 
trying to explain these problems to them and so forth. So I love them all. I've given my time for free. They never even paid me for my time. There's no personal reward for me telling them the things that I've told them. None at all. Like they're not in my life generally. I, like so I, uh, it's not even about trying to get them out of my life or anything. There's no personal reward at all. If they could feel that, then maybe they might have taken it a bit more seriously, right? Would we see that as an actual reward in a way? Because you would see somebody telling you the truth as, as a, a reward, reward yeah. of your desire to know truth, instead yeah. of seeing it as a trauma associated with being attacked. Do you see? Yeah. You would see it like that. So if you could measure yeah. the feeling mm. coming from the person. So a rewards on earth, because we normally think of rewards as payment or something like that, or my addictions met, like mm -hmm. approval. So if God actually um, gives us a reward for something, let's say I've done something right, like according to God's laws, would I see that on earth? Would I get that reward on oh, some of level? Of course you yeah. do. But for most of us, we're not sensitive so, enough exactly. to even see it. We don't see the brightening of our condition. We don't see the attractions that have now caused. You know, anything that good, that's good that happens to us, what do we believe? Um, we just it happened because I deserved it, uh, <laughs> is usually what we believe. Yeah. That anything that good that happened, happened because I deserved it. Anything that bad happened, happened because... I got punished. Somebody else was good. being stupid, yeah. Mm. Somebody else did the wrong thing there. So we blame other people for anything bad that happened to mm. us and ourselves for everything that happened that's good. Mm. Now, with God, God's measuring the goodness in the person and constantly giving reward. And you will feel that when you bring your life into harmony with those, that state and also are sensitive enough to feel it emotionally. Like... I have a lot of confidence about my passing. Like, you get, you'd be surprised what emails I get. It's like, man, I get some real vicious emails. When you die, you're going to be in hell for... And off they go, you know. And I'm going, no, like, I know God's a loving God. I know my motivations are pure, right? I can feel the reward of my pure motivations from God. I already can feel it from him now. So do you think I'm worried about them saying all those things? Of course not. They can believe what they want. Their attack of me, on the other hand, I can feel that too. And I can feel what God feels about that. And the reality is a lot of what they're saying to me is actually going to happen to them. And I can feel that too. Yeah. Right? And so you then go around not being driven by this constant need for your addictions being met because you can actually feel in the life you have now the constant rewards that come from living your life in harmony with love and truth. That's great. Makes Thank sense. You. Yeah. But frequently on earth we're not sensitive to that, Sandra, and as a result of our lack of sensitivity, we, uh, we then believe that God's not responding and unfortunately, we believe that all of our life on earth until we pass. And then when we pass, we realise, ah, God was responding. But the only trouble now is I've engaged a whole heap of unloving behaviour, which now has to be corrected. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. So far better to become sensitive to these things now than later. Mm. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, it means that we are drunk on our own perception of law, right? Doesn't it? We basically believe that our own perception of law is correct. God's, God, God's uh, thing, feelings about law are incorrect. My perception of law is correct. And as a result of that, I act like my perception of law is correct with God's laws. That's what I do. I see God's laws similar to how we see human law. I impose my perception of human laws on God's laws and I create a huge amount of pain and suffering for myself, but also for other people too, eh? Because of my choices here. Uh, that's what I do. And that's the result of this sort of hangover we have. And we'll talk a lot more about what the hangover feels like emotionally. It feels like with our emotions and, and attitudes. So the human law attitude, the human attitude to law is compromised. This is what I'd like you to see. That your own attitude to law is tainted by what's happened to you emotionally in your childhood and throughout your adult life in regard to what's occurred with regard to law. 
And it affects every one of us, honestly. Like I've had to make huge amounts of, of, of adjustments in this life, coming to terms with how my perception has been incorrect about God and God's laws. Right? And you're going to have to make huge amounts of adjustments too if you really want to get into a loving condition. So God's laws are real different to human laws, right? We've got to start seeing, we've got to start divorcing them. Now, at the moment, though, we believe they're married, you know. Human law, God law, same crap, you know, is the way we feel inside of us. But, but we've got to change that. Now, you're only going to change that through releasing some of the problems or pain associated with human law and also embracing some of, with desire, embracing some of these principles regarding God's law. That's the only way you can actually change it. Yeah. So our resistance to law is based on these flawed viewpoints of love and truth that come from childhood and parental and society experiences. So we need to, you can see here that while it's lovely to have a conversation about God's principles governing law, which will help us understand God's laws, at the end of the day, we're going to have to work through emotions and release emotions about how we have come to see law in order to accept these principles and actually practice them in our day-to-day -day life. That's what we're going to have to do. And that's going to be a, quite a painful process for some of us because we're so used to getting away with things and believing we're going to get away with things. So that's going to need to be corrected as well, that attitude. And remember, God's principles are all trying to correct your attitudes already. You've just got to go along with it. Uh, go along with these corrections that will occur if, and will occur naturally if you... <laughs> particularly if you receive God's love and connect with God himself. So that's the human law comparison. You understand the problem. So this, the point of this talk is really to help you understand the problem and then we'll start looking at what the solutions are later. Does that make sense? But at least if you can understand the problem, then you can start to examine what the potential solutions may be. And we will look at the potential solutions on day four of this group. So two, three days' time, we'll look at the potential solutions. All right, well, that brings us to the conclusion of that discussion. What we're going to do now is just have, uh, if we can have a 10-minute break, so it'd be 10 past four, and Mary's going to try to squeeze everything she wants to squeeze into 20 minutes, um, but uh, it's going to be quite difficult. We'll see how we go, all right? <laughs> so we'll see how we go. Thanks, guys. Thank you.